God's blessings on the faithful and the obedient. May the Spirit of God give you ears to hear. May He open up your mind and your heart for salvation through the word that I preach to you. The word is, was made flesh. It is Jesus Christ. May His Spirit draw you closer to the God, to God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ so that you may know that you have salvation through him. I'm Brother Joseph Herbert. I want to get on here to talk about, well, continue in First John. My last three videos, well, actually my last four videos was First John chapter 1. I did, I had to break chapter 2 up in two videos. And then there's chapter 3, my last video. So this is chapter 4, which is, you know, in detail of and direct direct instructions telling John is telling you plainly of if you are this way then you're a liar if you're that way then you are safe in God Almighty and so he is very he has to be direct the Christian must be direct and you know Jesus Christ when he was given parables he was giving parables, but it wasn't to their understanding. It wasn't to their, um, it was to them so they can, so that the seed of what God is speaking, Jesus Christ was speaking, will be sown on his heart, on their hearts. You have the different grounds, the parable of the sower. And so Jesus Christ was the and is and is to come the Lamb of God. And so one of the things is that we are, the Spirit of God gives us discernment to discern by righteous judgment or rightly judging uh, who is false and who is not. Jesus, Jesus clearly told us that in Matthew chapter 7, uh, what that looks like. He said, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly they are ravenous wolves, ravening wolves. And then he, he says, you will know them by their fruits. So what did he mean by that? He's, you will know, he explains. He says a good tree um, bears good fruit and a bad tree bears bad fruit or corrupt fruit. Then he says, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit. Neither a bad tree can bear good fruit. Now this analogy, he says, for every tree that does not bear good fruit, it will be cut down and thrown into the fire. So in this chapter, ver uh, chapter 4, verses 1, I'm going to go ahead and start reading here. Uh, First John, it starts off now. For John is talking to the believer. He's talking to the, Christ the Christian who is full of the Spirit of God, born again, truly. He says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits where they are of God, because many false prophets are going out into the world. It's the same as today in this generation. Um, God's kingdom is from generation to generation. He has an everlasting dominion. Um, I forgot who said that in... No, I didn't. It was King Nebuchadnezzar he said, who said that after his reasoning was restored and he gives, he's giving praises to God. He says, your dominion is an everlasting dominion. That's what he says. So man has dominion in the earth, not just every man because of the fall of man. Before the fall of man, animals were not attacking people. Lions was not, lions was not attacking uh, human beings. Birds was not flying away from human beings because of the fall of man got cursed the ground and the fall of man is the deception of the old serpent, the devil, who beguiled Eve. Eve bit the fruit and gave to her husband. He bit the fruit. Now you have the fall of man. Now you have natural disasters. Now you have insects that suck blood, leeches. You have different things. Lions are attack. Wild animals are attacking people. Um, you have 
many diff different things that we just we have known as the fall of man. But the man of God, the man of God, we have dominion. We don't fear. This chapter describes what happens when you have fear. Later on in this chapter, and it's down, it's down in which verse this is? Give me one second here. It is verse where it says perfect love cast out. Yeah, verse 18. So when we get to 18, so let me read this again. Verse 1, it says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. How do you try the spirits? Well, Jesus says you will know them by their fruits, by their behaviors, by what comes out of their mouth, by how they think. The word of God says, as in water face, answers to face. Excuse me. So a man's heart to the man. So the man's heart to man. Meaning what's in man's heart is who man is. And what is being communicated from the heart of man, it is. Can be it can reflect what's who man communicates with. So if man is evil or man is ungodly, and the person who he communicates with is also ungodly, both are ungodly. But if the man, if, if an ungodly man is communicating with a godly man, and the godly man does nothing about it, the word of God says evil communication corrupts good manners. The word of God also says to, to be not unequally yoked with together with unbelievers. Meaning, um, and what Paul even explained that in that chapter as well. He says, how can light fellowship with darkness? How can Christ have communion with Bilal? How can, uh, you know, it just don't go together. It just don't go together. So James puts it like this. Friendship with the world is enmity with God, meaning a believer cannot fellowship with the world because the world hates Christ. Therefore, the world is going to hate the Christian. Jesus said it. He said it in John chapter 15. He says, if the world hate you, remember that it's hated me before it's hated you. He said, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. If you're of the culture and you love the culture, the, cult, the those who are of the world that are of that part of that same culture will love what you're doing, will support you. Um, it's like that all the way around. Whether it's false religion, whether it's uh, sports entertainment, whether it's uh, the, the movies and all these other things that are in the world. If you're a politician and you know, they're going to be... There are others who love politicians and talk about the presidents and and we, the true men of God, focuses on Jesus. So John says, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. And again, how do you try the spirits? One of my one of my, my old methods of evangelism, um, growing up in the faith, I did learn how to evangelize by watching a uh, show and it's still online somewhere. The way of the masters, the way of the master, is by individual. I learned how to evangelize by watching the individual. I'm not gonna say his name, but you know, the Lord taught me how to evangelize through by watching this show, and it was a method that I picked up. But I could not. I had to stop watching it because, for one, I don't know the person, and there was no evidence. That they follow up with people who they evangelize to. So to disciple someone was out of the picture. To disciple someone, to follow up with someone is out of the picture. And so, but I kept hold of the method of evangelizing and one-on-one -on -one evangelism. And the Lord just enhanced me in my walk to continue doing what I, because I, I love the kingdom of God. I love to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. But the try the spirits is asking someone, so you, do you go to church? This, this is one way. 
Do you go to church? You know, or directly just to the point. If you were to die today, where do you think you will go? And most people will say heaven. Most people consider themselves to be a good person. Well, have you kept the Ten Commandments? This is again. Me, I'm just reiterating what I used to uh, approach people with. Have you kept the Ten Commandments, or have you ever heard of the Ten Commandments? And they will say, some will be like yes, some will be like uh, yes, but they have no clue what the Ten Commandments is. They you know they don't know. Some don't know. Some most people do know. And they would say yes. I say, so let me test you out to see if you are a good person and you have kept the Ten Commandments. Now, this is the ninth commandment: you shall not lie. Out of your whole, out of your whole entire life, how many times have you think you told a lie? Well, who hasn't lied? Or, well, I've told many lies, or billions of lies. Then, uh, then I would ask, well, what does that make you? A liar, a liar. That's the ninth commandment. You should not lie. Then the eighth commandment, have you ever stolen anything regardless of the value, even something small? Piece of bubble gum. You may have downloaded music illegally. You may have stolen information or stolen something. Have you ever did that? Uh, yes. God would, would, what would you call somebody who steals? A thief. And these, these questions I would ask people. Um, have you ever took God's name in vain like a oh my G-O-D use his name as a curse word out of disgust or excitement or even the name of Jesus? They would say yes. And that's called blasphemy. God takes that very seriously. And I would take tell him that Exodus 20 and 7 says the Lord will not hold him guiltless. Whoever takes his name in vain. And then I'll be like, just like they say on the show, I'll be like, this is the one that got me. Now, <laughs> You always have to. I will always have to say that because that's what's being said on the show, and that's why I had to like to sh to uh, shun it a little bit because it became a method. It almost became robotic, and and I wanted to grow, and it, and and it be enhanced in the faith by the Spirit of God, and he but he has blessed me to do to to broaden the way I tried the spirits. And so I was like, this is the one that got me. Now, Jesus says, um, you have heard that it said that you should not commit adultery. But I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to lust after her has commit adultery with that person already in his heart. Have you ever looked at a woman or I would ask a woman, have you ever looked at a man with a strong sexual desire? And they'd be like, yes. Yeah. So this is not me judging you just like. Now, again, I'm reiterating what I used to say, what I, how I used to try the spirits. This is just one way, effective way, but I don't, don't stick to it. I allow the Spirit of God to help me grow in the process. So I'm like, this is not me judging you, but this is how God will see you when you stand before him. Because you're going to stand before him one day. Out of your own admission, God will see you as a liar, a thief, a blasphemer. And an adulterer at heart. Now, these are the four of the Ten Commandments. So, if God was to judge you by the standard of the Ten Commandments, will He find you innocent or guilty? Or what do you think He would do with the person? Because you said you was a good person, but this says you're not. And they were like, "Well, I believe I'm going to hell, or I believe I, I will, He will find me guilty." And if He finds you guilty, would it be heaven or hell? Uh, hell. Does that concern you? That's what they used to say on their show. So again, for me, it was very effective. But again, yes, I had to, I had to grow in my faith. The Lord has shown me many different ways on how to evangelize. So yes, that was one method of trying the spirits. That's just one way. And another way is you will know them by the. Now Jesus Christ says you will know them by their fruits. Do men gather thorns of grapes or figs or thistles? So yes. That meaning, can a banana tree grow apples? Or can an apple tree grow blueberries? No. An apple tree is an apple tree. A uh, banana tree is a banana tree. So Jesus is the propitiation of our faith. He's 
satisfied the wrath of God that was on that is on mankind who are not in the will of God, who are not truly born again. So, beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are going out into the world. Hereby, you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses, listen closely, not, because not everybody believes Jesus Christ is God. He says, hereby, you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. In verse 3, and every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist whereof you have heard that it should come and even now already is in, it is in the world. So, yes, I have encountered so many different people that say they are saved, that say that just because they go to church, they're saved. Or just because they've been baptized since they were five and they're their aunt took them to church and yeah and, and she prays every day not even what about you but she pray or my uncle or my father who was a pastor but you're in rebellion yeah you're they think they're saved because they are in church or their their uncle's a pastor no that they're they're not saved and if you ask them who is God if they don't say Jesus Christ that this word proves that they're not saved. The word of God proves them. Let me read verse 2 again. Hereby know ye the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Is of God. What do ye mean by come in the flesh? John chapter 1 puts it like this. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus Christ is described as the word of God. His word is spirit and life. And it quickens. It gives life. That's what he said in John chapter 6 verse 63. And so Revelation 19 also mentions the return of the Lord. Wait, let me see. We'll go there real fast. Revelation 19 says this. As I go here and say. So in verse 13, Revelation 19, verse 13 says, and he, that this is the return of Jesus Christ. This is when Jesus Christ comes. He says, it says, and he was clothed with a vexture dipped in blood. His clothing was dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. It's talking about Jesus Christ. His name, you read that again. Verse 13, it says, and he was clothed with a vexture dipped in blood. Why was it dipped in blood? It was the... The blood was for those who rebelled, you know, who rebelled. He and so he he cleansed, he cleansed his those who believed on him, those who believed on him with his blood. His blood is pure. His blood was innocent. Why innocent? Because he knew no sin. Now, why was it did his vexture dipped in blood? The wrath of God was is on the children of disobedience. Dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. I'm not going to read the whole uh, chapter right here because we're in 1 John chapter 4. But that's one example of God coming in the flesh. God, who is the creator of all things, who is the maker of heaven and earth by his wisdom and his spirit and understanding and knowledge. His mind, everything that you see is a manifestation of God's mind. His wisdom formed it. His understanding formed it. His knowledge, that is revelation, formed it. And as he speaks, power is transmitted. That's when, that's why when you, when in John, I forget, John chapter 18, yes, chapter 18, when the Roman guards and Judas the betrayer came looking for Jesus, and Jesus Christ asked, Whom do you seek? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And then when he when he answers, I am he. He says, I am he. Now that when he speaks, power is transmitted. And what happens when he said that? It says the, the Roman guards, those who came looking for him, fell back and fell to their faces because he said, I am he. 
Now, back in Exodus, Moses encounters a, a burning bush, which was God speaking to Moses in a burning bush. And he chooses Moses as the deliverer for the Hebrews to come out of Egypt. And Moses was indecisive. He was he was uh, afraid. And or and he also mentioned that what should I tell them? The Lord says, tell them I am sent you. I am. Then Jesus Christ in John chapter 8, he tells the Jews and Pharisees, before Abraham was, I am. And that's why they they try to gather stones to stone him. So when you try the spirits that to test them, because what it says in verse 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are going out into the world. Many false prophets, false Christians, false brethren, you tried them. The word of God proves who is who. God, by his spirit, proves in your mind who is who. Not fully because the disciples didn't know that Judas Iscariot was the traitor. So they, Jesus Christ, the Lord God, hit it from their minds. But Jesus Christ knew. So we don't, we don't focus on... The, like who is the Judas Iscariot or who are the traitors or whatever. But this word defines and describes, to be, it says believe not every spirit because there are false teachers, there's false prophets, false brethren that have came into the world and, and they are in error. Verse 4, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he in you than he who is in the world that is in the world so when you are truly born again you have the almighty in you you have christ and you have god's spirit in you you are obedient to the father you seek the father every day you seek jesus christ every day and you worship him in spirit and in truth you seek him in the secret place you do what the Father commands you to do and what Christ tells you to do. Jesus Christ fulfilled the law. He fulfilled the law. He says, I did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. So we obey God Almighty and Jesus. Yeah, are of God. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he that is in you than he is that is in the world. Verse 5, they are of the world. Therefore, speak they of the world, meaning they speak of the world, and the world hears them. Now, Jesus Christ, again in John chapter 15, he says, If the world, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. If you if you were of the world, the world would love its own. And so give me one second here. Give me one second here. If you are the world, the world will love you. Verse 19, read that. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. And so the world loves the, the LeBron James and the, the world loves the, the Stephon Curry's and the, the world loves their own, the pilot, the president's. Those who are ungodly, the world love their own. But if you represent Christ, if you are of the Lord God Almighty and worship Jesus Christ, they're going to hate you. They're not going to like who you are as Christ. You are to follow Christ and have your steps ordered by him. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Are ordered by the Lord. So verse 5 they are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He that knows God hears us. So those who want more truth, to know the truth, Brother Joseph speaks the word of God, teaches the word of God, preaches the word of God from the very Bible. No, I didn't go to seminary school. No, I didn't do, I, I didn't just got up one day, start reading the Bible and just start teaching. Man cannot do that. Natural man cannot understand the spiritual matters. 
man must be born again. So yeah, there are the world they are of the world, therefore they speak of the world, and the world hears them. Why do they hear them? Because the world loves its own. Jesus Christ said that. We are of God. He that knows God hears us. He that is not of God hears not us. So it's going to bypass them. Those who have hardened hearts. And bitterness is the root of that. They harden their hearts because of bitterness or the root of bitterness, as it says in Hebrews. They harden their hearts because they want to do what they want to do. They harden their hearts because they want to listen to what they want to listen to. They harden their hearts because they are self-righteous and they are of the devil. That's just the plain truth. That is the direct truth. But those who are hungry and thirsty for righteousness sake, Jesus Christ calls them blessed. He calls them blessed. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness for they will be filled. Filled with what? Filled with his spirit. Filled with the power of his glory to do what is commanded to do and be about the Father's business. Yes. Paul mentions about busybodies and other people's matters. So I thought about that. And I grew up hearing the saying, mind your business or mind your own business. You know, say our folks business. Now, as a believer, we don't be in people's business. We, when, when, when I get questioned, if I ever get questioned about somebody else's matters, I'm like, no, I'm minding my father's business. I must be about my father's business. I'm minding my father's business. And then that's an open door for evangelism. Who is your father? Well, since you asked. No, nah, I mean, I'm not going to get into that. That's another day. So, beloved, let us love one another. Let me see. Was I? Verse 6. Let me reverse this again. We are of God. He that knows God hears us. He that is not of God hears not us. Hereby we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Now, that's... That's a clear distinction. What is the spirit of truth? And what is the, how do you define the spirit of error? Well, John chapter 16, if I'm not mistaken, I'm going to hold my place in John, 1 John chapter 4. John chapter 16 says, if it's John 16, if not, I think it's John 15. It says this. As I turn to it. Okay, so. Nope, it's John chapter 15, verse 26. It's talking about the Holy Ghost, the Comforter. So in verse 26, it says, But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send, Jesus Christ, to you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth. The Holy Ghost is defined as the Spirit of truth because Jesus Christ is the truth. God is truth. His ways judgment. It says, Which proceeds from the Father, he shall testify of me so those who are truly born again they are of the spirit of truth those who deny jesus christ as the son of god those who deny jesus christ is god those who think that they are saved and are truly are not that is the spirit of error those who profess to be christian but yet they use profanity the, they think that the that salt and fresh water come out the same spring. They think that it's okay. Nothing wrong with getting tattoos or nothing wrong with drinking beer or nothing wrong with hanging out with people who get drunk. And the word of God does say in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 that no drunkard would inherit the kingdom of God. Will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's what it says. That's what it says. So, yeah. That is the spirit of error. That is the spirit of error on those who do these things, who are under it, under the influence of that. Verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. So the world has a perspective of what they think love is. Love is of the truth. Yes, I can Tell a person about Christ, whether they get offended or not, it's the truth. Joseph, am I going to hell because I just don't want to want to go to church or don't want to 
I, I'm a Roman Catholic. I, you know, am I going to hell? The truth, yes, you are. Yes, you are. Unless you are born again truly and serve the living God, obey him in spirit and in truth, filled with the Holy Ghost, yes, then, then you are saved. But after that, if you're not, if you are not of Jesus Christ, you're not saved. You're not born again. You're not going to heaven. Jesus Christ clearly tells you the way. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So how can you know the way? You obey Jesus Christ. And so he says this. And also in John chapter 15, verse, verse 8 of 1 John chapter 4 is a cross reference actually. Um, read verse 8 again. He that loves not knows not God, for God is love. So Jesus Christ commands. He says, this is my commandment that you love one another even as I have loved you. He wants, and don't misjudge or misunderstand what I say this. He wants to be. He wants you to be his friend. He tells his, his disciples, he says, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. He says, no longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master does or what his Lord does. But I have called you friends, and for all things I've heard of my Father, I've made known to you. So, the true born-again Christians, we hear from the Spirit of God, the Spirit of truth that proceeds from the Father. Christ has already interceded for us that our faith will not fail so our faith is being developed as we walk in the spirit, as we walk in the spirit of the living God, enduring to the end. When you were here, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have to be faithful. In order to be faithful, you have to be full of faith of the Lord. You can't just say, well, I have faith, but not do. James already made a description about that in James chapter 4. And James... Yeah, chapter 4, if I'm not mistaken. He says, the demons believe and tremble. Yes, the demons believe and tremble. So, yeah. When, okay, for an example, when the atheist die, when the atheist and the agnostic and the self-righteous and the lukewarm die and they end up in the place that was created for the devil and his angels, now they believe. But guess what? Guess what? It's too late for them. It's too late for them. Then they will be resurrected and stand before God and be judged of their thoughts, words, and actions while, when they were on the earth. They have no mercy where they're going. No mercy whatsoever. Mercy will escape them. And so then they, after they the judge, then there's a lake of fire. When Christ returns, that's where it will be. So verse 7, beloved, let us love one another for love is of God and everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. So why do you think in Acts chapter 7, Stephen, why do you think when it before, matter of fact, the end of chapter 6 when they, engage, they stared at him and he had, it says he had the, the face of an angel. Why do you think when he took in verse, chapter 7, when he took him all the way back to Abraham and reproved him all the way back, to, all the way to Christ. And then when he said, you stiff neck and stubborn people, how can you resist the Holy Ghost? They gnashed on him. Why do you think he said, Lord, hold not this sin to their charge? That's the love of God. That is the love of God. Beloved, let us love one another for love is of God. So he spoke the truth even though it pricked them to their heart. He spoke the truth. That's how the true born again Christian is supposed to be. Of her father's business, whether they will be pricked to the heart to reject you and what you say and who you are. Or they be pricked to the heart to ask, what must I do to be saved? Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. He that loves not knows not God. That just I didn't I didn't write this. Brother Joseph did not write this. He that loves not knows not God, 
For God is love. Yes, the the compromise or the inspirational Christian, and that's that is a possible way of putting that. That the compromise. They, you, they will have signs that says Jesus is love. He is love. That's true. God is love. That's what the word says. But what, how do you define love though? How do you define it? It's not just love without being, you know, the word of God, Paul by the Holy Ghost says, preach the word, be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. What did he mean by that? All long suffering means you're going to have people that's not going to like what you're preaching. You're going to have people that's going to be so pricked to the heart that they are going to be a bit indecisive. But guess what? They have a choice to make. They choose wrongfully. Their consequences, God will handle the matter. You have decisions to make on the planet Earth. You have decisions decisions to make on the planet Earth. That's why Moses in Deuteronomy 30, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you and have set before you life and death, blessings and cursings. Therefore, choose life that you and your seed may live and that you may love the Lord your God and that you may cleave to him. And everyone, what do he say after that? He says, and you may that you may obey the voice of the Lord. Obedience is better than the sacrifice. The prophet Samuel said that in First Samuel chapter 15. It tells uh Saul that, King Saul. So yeah, he that loves not knows not God, for God is love. Verse 9: In this was manifested the love of God toward us. Because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Now that's the gospel right there. You're going to live through Jesus Christ. If you, he said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it will be done for you. Then he says, henceforth or by this my father is glorified that you will bear much fruit so you will be my disciples. Yes, you, a, a disciple is one who is disciplined in Christ. Disciplined to obey. Disciplined to study. To show himself approved unto God. To study and to learn of Jesus Christ. That's a disciple of Christ. <coughs> Excuse me. Verse 10 of First John chapter 4. Herein is love, now that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation. There it is again, that word, propitiation for our sins. Propitiation got mentioned in chapter 1. Propitiation is, okay, so the wrath of God is on the children of disobedience. Who are the children of, the, of disobedience? The world, the ungodly, those who reject the will of God, live how they want to live, do what they want to do, speak how they want to speak. The ungodly, the goats. So, guess what? Jesus Christ died for them too. Jesus Christ died for the godly and the ungodly. It says that somewhere. It sounds like, I forget where that's at. I think that's in Philippians. But he died for the world. So to understand John 3.16, don't just have it as a, a most quoted verse or a memorable verse. Most Professed Christians don't even understand John 3.16. And, and John 3.16 is not even the whole gospel. It's, it's a key factor of truth for understanding. For understanding. That's not the whole gospel. You want to continue reading on that chapter. You have the gospel. You have the gospel. Verse, I got to read this again. Verse 10. Herein is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So propitiation, yes. The, the wrath of God is on the children of disobedience. What Christ did for us on that tree 2,000 years ago, it satisfied the wrath of God. When man believes on him and man receives the spirit and the blood of Jesus Christ is is it cleansed all sin. 
He will wash, wash you as far as from the east is to the west. That's ongoing. That's circulating. As far as the east is to the west, your sin is cleansed when you believe on him and when you obey, enduring to the end by the spirit of truth in you. Because greater is he that is in you than he who is in the world. And not many people understand the glad tidings of Jesus. Not many people understand the testimony of Jesus Christ, the power of God unto salvation, the gospel that most people are ashamed of, nor do they understand it. To understand the gospel, you must repent and believe on him. God will open up your wisdom and understanding in your mind so that you learn of him and he opens revelation. He, he gives you the mysteries. He, those who... He gives the mysteries to those who fear him. He gives the mysteries to those who fear him. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No, verse 12, no man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us and his love is perfected in us. Now what did John mean? God, we have, no man has seen God at any time because, you know, he is the maker of all things. That's why... I believe this is in Numbers when Moses tried to see his face, but he didn't see his face. He saw the back of God. He saw the back of God. If any, No man can see God. No man can see God. Yes, Jesus Christ is God manifesting in the flesh. You have what is written. That's why in the Ten Commandments, if any image, um, paraphrase when I make mention of this, any imagery of it is, is classified as idolatry. So when you see images of Jesus Christ, people, you see this in Catholic churches, you even see uh, image, uh, st uh, statues of Christ still on the cross. It, you know, people draw pictures of Jesus. That's idolatry. That's a sin against God. And they think that's Jesus, but Jesus is not on the cross. Jesus resurrected. He is now seated at the right hand of the Father. It's a statue in Brazil. A huge statue of what is supposed to be Jesus, you know, with his hands out, and I forget where that's at in Brazil. It's somewhere out there, and that's it. It goes to show what kind of religion is. It sounds like something the Catholics have built up. That's not Jesus. That's not Jesus. Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. No man has seen God at any time. So his disciples, those who believe. They saw Jesus, the, the ungodly, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the chief priests and elders. Yes, they saw Jesus, but they're not where Jesus is. They're in the other place. They're in the other place. Same place that the rich man is at. Same place that Judas Iscariot is at. Same place that King Saul is at. Same place that all these ungodly people, uh, Ahab and Jezebel, that's where they're at. That's where they're at. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us and his love is perfected in us. Hereby we know that we dwell in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the father sent the son to be the savior of the world. Verse 15. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the son of God, God dwells in him and he in God. So that's another uh, cross-reference what Paul said in Romans chapter 10 verse 9 through 13 that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and that the Father has risen him on the, on the third day, you will be saved. That's a promise from God. Yes. So verse 16, and we know, we have known him, we have known and believed the love of, that God has to us. God is love and he that dwells in love dwells in God and God in him. Verse 17. This is just reassuring the Christian that we are in God and God is in us. This is reassurance. Verse 17. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. So why will we have boldness? Because our faithfulness in God while we we are on the earth, we there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. We're not condemned already because we're born again. Jesus said it in John chapter three, 
he who believes not on me is condemned already. Yes, you believe not on Jesus Christ is the, is the Son of God, you're condemned already. So that's why the wrath of God is on those who, who are in disobedience or full-blown rebellion. Yes, that's why that is. Verse 17... Let me see. Where's that on verse? Verse 16. Move we'll verse 16 again. And we have known and believed that love that God has to us, God is love. And he that dwells in love dwells in God and God in him. Verse 17. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. Yeah, so we are to be, be like Christ. We are to be like Jesus Christ. He says... These signs will follow them that believe. In Mark chapter 16, they will cast out devils. They will speak with new tongues. If they drink anything deadly, it will not hurt them. And he wasn't talking about it to intentionally find something to drink that is deadly so you can prove that it won't hurt you. No, he's talking about he's talking about if you are ignorant of a matter or something and some, or somebody's trying to poison you, it won't hurt you. It will not hurt you. Jesus Christ said it. And he also said that if they may lay hands on the sick, they will re recover. These are promises from Jesus Christ, the Lord, that these signs will follow them to those who believe. And so I have many testimonies where I laid hands on my children and they recovered or they, you know, the stomach butt left them or the headache left them. I have many different testimonies when I laid hands on people because I want to be like Jesus Christ and I am, I have Christ in me and I am in Christ. He's abiding in me. His word is abiding in me. He is greater in me than he who is in the world. I am a son of God. I have dominion in the earth because Christ said so. The Lord said so. That these signs will follow them that believe. Yes. There is no fear in love. There he is. Now, I just talked about this in the beginning of the video about uh, the, the spirit of fear. Um, if you're fearful, you will not, you will not be successful as a Christian. When you're fearful, you will not believe. When you're fearful. The Hebrews were fearful when... They was approaching the Red Sea and they saw Pharaoh and his armies coming from behind them. Then they start railing at Moses. Moses turns to the Lord and just the Lord, the Lord commanded him to raise his staff. And then there's the parting of the Red Sea. And it says in other places, I believe it says in Psalms somewhere that even at the Red Sea, there was complaining and murmuring. There was complaining and murmuring because of unbelief, because of bitterness, because of fear. So... Verse 18 says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear has torment. He that fears is not made perfect in love. What did he mean by that? He, he is perfect love cast out fear. If you are, if you have Christ in you, God, the father in you, the spirit of God in you, you are, you have what is greater in you than he was in the world. You don't fear, we don't fear man. Jesus already said it. Do not fear the one who can kill the body, but fear him that can destroy both body and soul in hell. We fear God. That's the only, that's whom we fear. And we fear him out of high reverence. We don't fear man. We don't, what is man, what can man do to us? Yes, man can do many things to us, but we don't fear him just because they're doing the things to us. Christ Christ, when he went to the cross, yes, he did not want what was to happen to him, but he was willing to go and finish the work. That's why he said it is finished. It is finished. That's why he was still loving them. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's why he didn't say anything to the, the thief on the cross who railed on him, who railed on him. Say, if you be the Christ, save us and yourself. He was he, he, he was out of his mind. He was tormented by the fear and his lifestyle. He was a thief. That's the reason why he was on the cross. He just, it, it will drive you to a mindset that makes you rebel, don't care what comes out of your mouth. That's what happens when you don't commit to the Lord. That's what happens. And so God came into the world as 
born a human being, born from a virgin, fully God and fully man, and without sin. He grew as a tender plant and a root out of a dry ground. Why a dry ground? Because God cursed the planet, cursed the earth because of the fall of man. The tender plant represents the purity of a plant in perfect obedience. Jesus Christ was perfect and obedient to the Father. No sin was ever found in him. No deceit was ever found in his mouth. He was perfect and obedient to the, to the God, the Father. And so, verse 19, we love him because he first loved us. Verse 20, if a man say, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he that loves not his brother whom he has seen, then how can he love God whom he has not seen? What did Jesus Christ tell Thomas in John chapter 21? Chapter 20. Let me turn it real fast. What did he tell what most churches call him doubt, doubting Thomas? Because he, he, he did not believe unless he touched the nail prints in Jesus Christ's hands and put his finger, put his uh, hand through his side. So Thomas doubted in verse 27. No matter of fact, I'm going to start in verse 26 of John chapter 20. And after eight days again, his disciples were with them and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, peace be unto you. Verse 27, then said, then he said to Thomas, reach here your finger and behold my hands Reach here your hand and be thrust into my side and be not faithless but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus says this. This is very powerful what he said. This is for those who are believers. He Jesus says to Thomas, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are they that have not seen me and believe. That's that's for me and you. We have not seen Jesus Christ, uh, but we believe. Some have. I'm not, now I'm not going. Some have. We had. We. That's another topic for another day. I don't want to get into that. So, people, uh, there are people that is that would say that I don't believe in God because I can't see Him. Or I don't, you know, but you believe that you believe wind when it blows leaves. You can't see that either. You believe the trees blowing back and forth when the wind is blowing real hard, but you can't see the wind. You believe the TV being cut on, but you can't see the frequency of the remote control leaving the remote control and hit hitting the, the receiver going back to the satellite, coming back down from the satellite to cut the TV on. But you you don't believe what you see. The, the word of God, Paul by the Holy Ghost says, to walk by faith and not by sight. So yes, Jesus Christ says, blessed are those who have not seen but believe. Yes, that's what we are. We are believers. If a man say, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he that loves not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? Verse 21, the last verse. And the commandment we have from him that he who loves God Loves his brother also. So when when I gather with the church, my church, my home church, I am so delighted to see my brothers and sisters because we're getting ready to worship the Lord God Almighty and the Lord Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. We worship God in spirit and in truth. And we delight. We sing new songs as the word of God says. We we take delight. Great measures of joy are on us because we love the Lord and we we preach his word we do what he says we listen to our leaders our pastors and those who are over us that describes a healthy church that's what God wants man to be in and be because of safety in the house of God there is safety in the house of God I like the way it says in Psalms maybe Psalms 53 I am like a green olive tree in the house of my God what is a wild olive tree? Because an olive tree is full of oil, rich oil, and describes the anointing 
of God. I am like a green olive tree in the house of my God. So we remain in the house of God until Christ comes so that we spend forever with God in Jesus' name. I'm Brother Joseph Herbert, and this is for his glory.